All right, now I'm going to teach you how to fast. Now the teaching is going to be covering how, all right? And he spake a parable, uh, verse 1, unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and what? Not to, not to faint. That's important. When you're praying, you should not be fainting. Now go to the book of Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Now, this is the problem with people. So, good job that you want to fast and pray, but you're going to make a big mistake where you actually go off the gun and then you fast and pray. I'm going to do it 40 days, 40 nights like Moses did. No, you're going to die, okay? Because actually, that's not what God wants. God does not want you to faint. God does not want you to faint when, uh, when you're fasting. Because look at this text over here. We're going to look at the book of Mark, chapter 8. And then notice verse 3. And if I send them away fasting to their own ha houses, they will what? Faint by the way. Okay, look, Jesus is not against people who fast to a point where they faint by the way. That's why, uh, verse 2, he wanted to give them something to eat. Because remember, men always ought to pray and not what? See, so if you faint when you pray, then the prayer doesn't work. I mean, uh, it, is, it is a matter of fact, uh, if we're going to talk about health-wise speak, speaking, nutritionally speaking, that uh, when you start off fasting, you're going to experience a little bit of dizziness. So then you lose lack of concentration and focus. So it is important that you don't fast so much to a point where you faint. So you can't uh, starve yourself to a point where you faint. So that's important within Mark chapter 8 and uh, Luke chapter 18. All right, we're going to also turn to the book of Acts chapter 27. Acts 27. So when you do fasting, it is important that you actually research yourself. So I could probably give you some health tips, but the best uh, care that you would know, uh, who would know better about your body is you actually, because you know how you feel, you know how you focus, how you think. So the best advice is you take care of your own health yourself. So research about your health. God does not want it when you hurt your own health when you fast. Because why? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So you're supposed to take good care of the body. Look at the book of Acts, chapter 27. Now look the danger here at verse 9. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now what? Dangerous. Why? Because the fast was now already passed. These people were observing some fast ordinance, and because of that, when they were sailing, where they're going to hit a storm, it became a dangerous point. Why? Because their health was in, they, they did not have the health to fight through the storm later. Look what Paul had to do at verse 33. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your what? Health. Health. So that's important. So research online on how to fast. And they will give you tips on how to fast and how to take it gradually, step by step, I mean, I know you want to be a prayer warrior and you want to sh say, man, I fasted for 40 days, 40 nights like the Lord Jesus Christ, which is unrealistic because Moses and Jesus, they did it through the supernatural power of God. Realistically, you can't survive without water for three days. That's uh, an average rate routine. All right, let's look at the book of Daniel 10. So because I mentioned about diet, that's important, all right? So fasting is not where you die of thirst. Actually, you should be drinking a lot of liquid during your fasting. Fasting, how it comes down to a point where you do it without food and water, you can only do it for an extended long period of time when you gradually reach that more and more, when you get used to it more and more. But actually, you should be drinking a lot of water during your fasting. 
and you should eat selected portions when you start out. You might say, really, that's fasting? Yeah, because look at verse 2, Daniel chapter 10, verse 2. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate, look what he did in fasting. What? No pleasant bread. Neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. It never said water. It never said fruits and vegetables. It was talking about more solid substances of food. That's fasting. That's how you properly start out is... You get rid of more of the fatty food, more of the solid food. So in fasting, how it goes, it goes by selected meals. So selected diet. So you got to look at your diet and select it. Start it out that way. In time, you can do it more and more. There are people who accomplished, I think, 30 to 40 days. There are some people who did that, actually. I wish I can do that, too. If I did that, then I'd be skinnier than what you already see, and then I'd be death. You'd see death every single Sunday. <laughs> All right. So let's look at Judges chapter 20. Judges chapter 20. To do fasting started out as small, short amounts. You don't have to do it for a couple days. Start it in short amounts and then increase it. You might say, is that properly fasting? Yes. Short duration... Short periods is counted as fasting to the Lord. Didn't you know your pastor fasts a lot? Yeah, he fasts often. But it's not where you think that I'm such a prayer warrior that, oh, he fasted for a couple days and weeks. And No, it's not that. Fasting goes, look at the book of Judges chapter 20. Now look what the Jews did. That God finally answered their prayer because they did this at verse 26. 26. Now all the children of Israel and all the people went up and came unto the house of God, and wept, and sat there before the Lord, and fasted that day until what? Ah, see that? Until even. So fasting can go for short periods of time. So start out that way. That's how you can properly fast. And then you can increase it more and more. And then you can act like a Pharisee amongst our church and say, so I fast like 50 times throughout my life, or hundreds of times throughout my life. You know, you could probably do that. Of course, I jest, and your prayer don't count, right? According to Matthew chapter 6. Look at the book of Luke chapter 18. Luke 18. Now, Pharisees are actually acknowledged by Jesus Christ to be uh, the, one of the most righteous people. But they actually turn out to be the most prideful people and arrogant people that Jesus realized, and hypocrites. However... Uh, Jesus recognized that they were a role model in righteous standards and practices. So, look at this example. Pharisees even knew that following the most righteous example, there's a routine throughout a week. So, you can have a fast routine. So, it's not like uh, you champion out for the Lord for several days. No, go buy a routine like twice a week. That's actually considered a righteous standard, believe it or not, if you go twice a week. Because look what the, the Pharisee even recognized it and bragged it. He bragged about it. Look at Luke chapter 18, verse 12. The Pharisee said, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Why would he brag about that if fasting twice in the week is not really a big deal? So see, it is a big deal. So God's not looking for some type of Moses coming out of Mount Sinai or Jesus coming out of the wilderness 40 days, 40 nights without food and water. You die, man. They only survived that way because they had the supernatural power of God. Now, you go by a routine. Go by a routine. Now, some of these prayer warriors, uh, I hate to say this, but I have to say this. That way people don't get messed up in wrong doctrine. So, Leonard Ravenhill, God bless his heart, I give him as a primary example on prayer, which I highly recommend you to listen to. But because they get so uh, infatuated with this prayer, prayer routine, he gave an example of a guy who prayed so hard that the floor beneath him actually bent beneath his knees, which is, which is what I compliment. I said, man, that's a blessing. But the guy prayed so long where the floor bent beneath his knees that he died there. Now, that's not something where the Lord sees as, uh, you know, a height of spiritual epitome. I mean, fast twice in the week is considered as, that's pretty good to the Lord, all right? 
So don't think that you're so backslidden in your prayer life. Some people can get so deep devotionally, so deep into the prayer topic that they teach, nevertheless teach something wrong. That's important to be aware, okay? That's important to be aware. So I hate to say that about Ravenhill, but it's got to be, uh, but you got to realize this, like I've told you a long time ago in videos that unless you're a Bible-believing Christian, attending a Bible-believing church, knowing King James dispensational truth, attending these kind of people, then you would, uh, then you would know more properly and uh, you can uh, fall less prone to errors. So that's very important. That's why it's important to get involved in that, I keep saying. Get involved in the Bible-believing work in church. Because if you don't and you're by yourself, despite the best intentions you might have, like some of these people, you'll, still, you'll teach something wrong and even hurt somebody. So uh, have a fast routine, and the Lord will bless it, and go to Psalms 109. Psalms chapter 109. And I will close it right here. Now, this is extremely important that you want to know, okay? Psalms 109. This is kind of a little bit of a sermon that you might like, too. Psalms chapter 109. Or you might hate it if you're very fleshly. <laughs> Don't uh, satisfy the flesh. That is important to know. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Because after you finish fasting and praying, the tendency is to go for a nice big pizza and chocolate and ice cream and dessert. Actually, um, some Christians and some people who practice fasting recommend that is not what you want to do because then you bloat up uh, your stomach and your health. But actually, uh, the reason why some Christians deny this too is because you know what you're doing? Because here you are at a spiritual plane and height that you've accomplished by diminishing the feast of the flesh. But what did you do when you bloat your flesh up again? See, then you're, what happened to that spiritual height? So that's so important. You don't want to go back into like, uh, after you finish fasting, then you go, okay, blah, 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 like that. Even people who practice fasting, uh, secular lost people, not in a spiritual manner, but a physical fleshly manner, know that they can't just go back to eating fatty food immediately after that. So go to Psalms 109. This is the key with fasting at verse 24. My knees are weak through fasting and my flesh, what? Faileth of fatness. That is fasting there. Fasting is where the flesh fails. The flesh fails. So when you finish fasting, obviously it's not like don't eat anymore, don't drink, but just go back to your normal routine. All right? You are just living normal everyday lives right now, and fasting is the different pointer. So then uh, when you finish fasting, just go back to normal. It's that simple. Just go back to normal. So go back to your normal routine. Now here's another thing. When you're trying to fast and pray, People make it up with not just fleshly food to make up for it. They'll do fleshly things to make up for fasting. So maybe watching a lot of television, getting to social media a lot. God forbid, but some people get into drugs. That's possible. That, that way they can go on fasting for a long period of time. That, that definitely, sin don't make you better. Secular music. Uh, going outdoors with people and fellows uh, try to make up with social gatherings, stuff like that. So you don't feed your flesh. Just go back to a normal routine. This is not college where I'm going to put all my hard work and effort to an exam and once the exam is over, I'm going to party and just uh, eat a lot of food and hang out with my bud buds. No, that's, this is not college. This is not like high school, okay? You're just going back to a normal routine and you gradually build it up, okay? So then uh, you go back to the normal routine. As a matter of fact, some people recommend just go by pulse, go by fruits and vegetables when you get back, and then slowly put more solid food into it. Now, here's something that's interesting. Actually, this is the final one, so I'm sorry. Go to uh, the book of 1 Corinthians 7. Now, this might be surprising to you, but this is actually true. I don't know if anyone taught this yet, but uh, I discovered it. So look at the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 
Now, I don't know if you knew this. At the book of Exodus, go to 1 Corinthians 7, 1 Corinthians 7. At the book of Exodus, when God was going to meet, to the, pe meet the people and talk to them, so remember, prayer is like talking with God, right? When God was going to communicate face to face with them, he told the husbands not to sleep with their wives. He said to abstain that. Why? So that uh, the communication can be holy with him. Because uh, it is true God says that the marriage bed is undefiled and holy, but that's between you, that's between you and the spouse. The privacy of you too, that's it. But then when you come before God, see, when it's a relationship between you and God, and especially when you uh, communicate with other people, obviously they don't want to know what you did the, uh, the day before, all right, with your loving spouse, all right? We don't want to know. So obviously there is something, let's be honest, that is unclean about it. So when you communicate with the Father, He wants that actually separated. Because look at the book of... 1 Corinthians chapter 7, don't let the devil distract you, okay? The devil wants to distract you from what I'm going to show you now. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 5, okay? The Bible says, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, uh, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So this is speaking of context verse 4. The husband and wife together. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4 through 5 says that actually a man and a wife, they should have relationship with each other. Uh, don't defraud the marriage bed from each other. So you should be together. However, when it comes to fasting and prayer, God says that's the exception. You get away from that. In fasting and prayer, you get away from that. So basically, the uh, marriage bed, abstain, abstinence. So actually, if some of you are already single, then that's not a problem for you, right? So if you're single, that's... <laughs> so if some of you are single, this, uh, this is, uh, you can practice this. But if you're married, oh, I, I forgot an E after marriage. But if you're married, here's the thing. If you're going to practice fasting and prayer, some preachers may not know this. Some Bible believers don't know this. But uh, this is, now, I'm not going to say that, uh, this is 100% doctrine that, hey, so if, uh, man, if you don't sleep on the couch in the living room that night when you fast and pray, then God's not answering that prayer. I'm not going to teach it that way. But if I'm going to come to my own preference and conviction, I think that's the case. I think that is the case. The case is where you don't... Okay, thank you, brother. All right, I was going to do that. All right, I was going to do that. Rats. Man, the devil just wants, wants you not pay attention. All right. So let me conclude it this way. The conclusion is this. The conclusion is, is that so if you're a Bible-believing preacher or even a Bible-believing person and you're married, that's something you might want to think about where uh, you might have to sleep in separate rooms. That's good. Might be. Because uh, I'll tell you what, I would if I'm going to fast and pray. If I fast and pray, I'm going to practice that actually. 